what now, what next, which just changes the entire conversation. Because when you don't do that, often the conversation ends up being about the data or about the graph in ways that actually isn't helpful or useful for anyone. That was Cole Knopflick of Storytelling with Data, and she is one of the biggest and brightest voices in this space, which is all about helping you understand how to communicate more effectively using data data visualization. So today we're going to talk about her career. We're going to talk about these lessons, what to do if you're new into the space, or if you're just not someone that thinks that you can really be a big data storytelling presenter. All those things will be covered on today's show. So sit back and enjoy my interview here with Cole Knopflick of Storytelling with Data. Welcome to the show. This is the Free the Data podcast. And the idea here is to get insights and lessons from folks like yourself that are advancing our world in data and whatever other, like whatever follows that word data, because there's so many different ways to slice and dice what we do. Um, But before we uh, get into that, let me just, uh, I want to hear a little bit about, you know, what you're like, where you came from in terms of your career in data, and then what you're doing now. um, For those of you that for those out there that aren't familiar. Yeah, I mean, we can start with the way back and uh, I'll, I'll just touch briefly on the parts and then we can dive into any of it more if you'd like. Uh, so I think I, I started working with data and thinking about numbers in undergrad at university. I found myself as a math major because for me, math was hard and I enjoyed the challenge of it. And so I got a math degree in school and in junior year hit this point where I thought, well, what do you do with a math degree? So I think I actually bought the book at one point, what do you do with a math degree? Um, <laughs> what but a great up, book. Yeah, it Brilliant. was fascinating, right? Um, uh, you know, went to career sort of panels. Uh, I remember sitting through one by an actuary and thought, okay, I don't want to be an actuary, but what, what do I want to do? And actually ended up as an analyst in credit risk management in banking. Uh, it was at a bank in Seattle where I was living at the time and worked my way up there. And that was where I fell in love with data and where I really got familiar with working with large data sets and found how you can take this sort of magical power and turn numbers into pictures in ways that help people understand things better and can resonate with them and help them have smarter conversations and make better decisions. And so it, it, I took a few jumps from there, always looking for spaces where I could help be the translator because that's what I really enjoy doing. Uh, you know, I've got a math background, went to school and got a business degree as well when I was working. And so I've got the business speak, I've got the statistics speak, I can help translate these worlds to each other. Uh, and of course, making pictures with data is a fantastic way to be able to do so. So I spent some time in credit risk management and fraud management uh, private equity, and then I went to Google to Ooh, a new team called People Analytics, which I thought sounded fascinating because they were taking <laughs> all of the sort of statistical modeling that I was doing at that point with loans and debt and credit cards, and they were applying them with people. Uh, you know, employees, how do we predict when someone's going to leave or what's going to make them happy or what makes a good manager? All of these fascinating people questions that we had so much data to be able to do fun stuff with and look at much of it for the first time. And so I was still making graphs and using those and and started teaching others how to do so as well. And over time realized that I really enjoyed teaching this Mm. stuff. And because so many people touch so much data these days, no one really teaches us how to do this. And there's pretty simple, smart things that everyone can do to get more eyeballs, paying more attention to the data that you already find fascinating. And so I created a course that I taught at Google for a number of years and then realized through a couple of speaking engagements outside of that, that there's a whole world outside of Google that could also use this stuff. And so it's been a little over a decade ago now that I left Google. Thank you. And started storytelling with data. And so we 
are a small but mighty team, and our mission is to try to improve things and help people make graphs that make sense and move beyond just visualizing data and really thinking about how do you connect with your audience, right? How do you weave that data into a story that engages and informs and hopefully ultimately motivates people to act and and do things in smarter ways? So it comes full circle, but at scale. Yeah, Uh, I love it. And and so you so you were in Google fairly early, right? I mean, obviously, I was it's a there completely... 2007. I joined, yeah, and it was at the you know it was on the high growth where we were doubling in number of employees every year. Yeah. Uh, I left in 2012, so it was a fun time when the, yeah. we were building a lot of stuff. So I think we just we just kind of barely missed each other there because I worked. Oh, uh, when were you there? Well, I was not at Google. I was at Facebook, so uh, I was just okay. down the street. But yep. it was. You know, I, I I was like late 2011, early 2012, yep. and I was doing um, Tableau consulting. And so okay. I actually came to know of you through Paul Zawatsky, who used to work at Tableau. Oh, and I understand what a small is a, world. Paul's yeah. married to one of my best friends. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Because I, I think later on when, when I started to get into this teaching thing, um, well, I, you know, he mentioned you as like, oh, yeah, she's doing something like that. It's super cool. And I, was, and I remember, so I'm, I'm so happy you're here because I've been a fan for such a long time. Oh, I love it. So funny. And there's a lot of this, you know, both worked in Silicon Valley. We both yeah. hate pie charts. I mean, we have a lot of things <laughs> in common. So I'm thrilled to have you on. And it's such a good story to hear that you were able to do that. Now, did Google encourage this kind of I know, you know, they were famous for this 20% time when you can do kind of whatever. Was that where storytelling with data came from? Or was it more of a moonlighting thing where you're at nights and weekends coming up with this stuff? I mean, where did it it come from initially? Yeah, great question. It was honestly a little bit of both. So in people analytics where I was working, so the 20% time projects that that you hear about, right, which is an employee has 20% of their time to work on a passion project, which sounds awesome. And that happened more on the engineering side. Uh, mm. You know, things like uh, Gmail came out of you know, some amazing. of these uh, know. amazing products came out of some of these efforts. Um, but then you'd get um, flexibility, let's say, to be able to do things. And so I, I always enjoyed making graphs and, and taking time with the aesthetics of, of how we present data on the people analytics team. So I s- over time became the de facto person that people would come to to brainstorm or get ideas or help make graphs and presentations. And there was a point in time where we were developing uh, in people operations at Google, uh, almost like an internal MBA-like program to be able Mm. to send. It was mainly for the HR generalists to be able to send them through to get broad exposure to different facets uh, of skills that would be useful for them. And so they came to me and said, would you like to build a course on data visualization? And so it's like, well, yeah, that would be amazing because I kind of, I've learned some things through trial and error, but that gave me a point where I could pause and, you know, read some books. And really there wasn't a ton out there at that point. It was Tufty's books, Mm -hmm. Stephen Few's books, right, which I devoured all of those, uh, everything that Colin Ware ever wrote, right, about process processing information. And so those became like my Bibles. And then it was figuring out how do I take what I'm learning here and now turn that into something that I can teach others, uh, which Mm. was not something I'd done before and was great fun. And there was a lot of trial and error in that as well. But that also was where I really learned why do some things work, right? And why do some things work better than others? And how can Mm -hmm. we actually watch responses in people as we put things in front of them to get a better understanding of what works and what works better. And that reminds me of the Google study, I believe on uh, tracking people's eyeballs on web pages Mm -hmm. and how people scan the page. And I know I've seen some of that in, in some teachings out there about when you're designing a data viz, you can kind of use those lessons of like, this is just naturally how people look at a web page. So you should try to use that. Right. Yep. And try to work within that or give people strong signals if you're going to go against it. Right. And that's where contrast mm-hmm. and sparing color can be so useful at getting people to look where you want them to look, even if it might not be where their eyes would naturally first land. So, yeah, right. simple things that once you know them and you tell them and you say them to someone else, then they can start using those tips as well. So, I started teaching the course as part of this program at Google. And then we had such broad interest in it that we rolled it out across the company where 
any Googler could elect to come and take the course. And so at first I was teaching, then I was teaching other people to teach it and got the opportunity to be able to travel around the world uh, oh, fun. and teach, which was awesome, uh, and observe you know, people from all parts of the company, salespeople, engineers, right, accounting, like everybody coming to these courses, which was so interesting to me that everyone needs to communicate with data. Nobody really gets taught how to do this. And we're all coming at it with different skill sets and different motivations, and different audiences. But it's really the same fundamental underlying pieces that we can make use of to be effective. And so as those bells started going off and I had some opportunities to speak outside of Google, that was where it became evident that there's, there's a greater world, right? That yeah. can benefit from some of this stuff. That's so fantastic. I mean, and it's, it's great that Google is a company that supports these kind of things. Um, yeah. Well, I, I had know, an incredibly yeah. supportive manager and you asked about, you know, were you sort of doing this on your own time? And it, it morphed into that where when I started mm -hmm. getting requests from outside of Google and asking, you know, can I do this? There were a couple of early ones that were part of our client teams. And so it made sense, but then it started getting more uh, arm's length. And so I had a very uh -huh. supportive manager who said, yes, you should do this. You can do it on your own time, your own equipment. And so yeah. for the first couple of years, you know, I'd take every vacation day and I'd be taking red eyes across the country <laughs> to go and talk to whomever wanted to listen to me talk about this stuff because it was so exciting to me and it's still exciting. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thing I wonder about all this is, so, so obviously you had a lot of success at Google and you've had a very fruitful career and being an entrepreneur now for, for over 10 years, I mean, amazing. Congratulations. Like that's tremendous. It's, I mean, even, it, you know, and, and so, I mean, it's, it's everything, right? Like I became an entrepreneur in 2016 and it's like stress and joy. It's almost like kids. Like when you have a kid, it's like all of the emotions turned up to 11 all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. being an entrepreneur is not too dissimilar. For me, a big change was because I, I had thought about it for a good amount of time and, and wavered, honestly, for a good amount of time of, you know, do I bring other people into the mix? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, is it just me? And I'm like the one person show. And, and I realized there was a point where I said, you know, that's, that's not enough, not because I want more, but because we can help so many more people on scale to be able to do more with more people. Yeah. And so we, yeah, we started hiring it's, I mean, that was probably five or six years ago now and have, it's a small team, right? I, I'm uh, slow mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. growth, um, in ways that I think have been helpful. Um, but yeah. it's been fun to be able to now teach others and, and see this work amplify in that way. It's a different thing, right? I mean, it's almost like when you go from an individual contributor to a manager, and no longer is it you writing the code, it's your team writing the code under the guidance or whatever parameters you put in front of them. And it's a different kind of gratification than, yeah. hey, you click that button and my code did a thing and it was awesome versus, hey, my team figured this problem out and now we're doing better. I mean, it's a totally different yeah. animal going it's from a, a company of one. Absolutely. It's a different feeling though as well. I wasn't fully prepared for the increase in accountability that I mm -hmm. felt as a result, right? Because now you have other, you know, it's not just my livelihood, now other people and their families yeah. and, you know, it, uh, it puts some pressure on, particularly when you get things like a worldwide pandemic <laughs> that shut down your business yes. model for a bit of time. So it's been, it's been a roller coaster, but. Right. Cause you, you do a lot of in person, right? A lot of your stuff is in person. Pre-pandemic, everything was in person. Right. And, and then it's so, going to... Uh, and then that shut off very quickly. <laughs> yeah. And I feel so fortunate that we were in, in a space where we could pivot and, and mm -hmm. do what we do online and actually learn a ton in the process and a ton of good things too. I think for me, one silver lining out of the past couple of years is we never would have been online in the way that we are now as a result of all of this, which just mm -hmm. means, you know, we can have workshops and have attendees in Australia and India and all over the world, yeah. uh, which is super. Do you still plan? Um, I mean, you know, if and when we ever get back to any kind of normalcy, <laughs> let's just imagine we could step our fingers and we're yeah. all back to normal. Do you plan on doing a hybrid or still keeping it mostly online or which one? I think we will forever forward have a strong virtual 
workshop component that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm-hmm. We are, we're hoping to get back in person and we're seeing signs of that sort of <laughs> start and stops. Uh, we've been doing some in person throughout, honestly, um, little at times, but mm-hmm. that. I imagine it's going to start picking up again. Um, we don't do hybrid. So we try not to do where you've got virtual participants and in person at the same time, because that's just mm. too much to try to optimize for. And somebody's getting the short end of the stick. So yep. we are, I'm, and this is a place I'm planning on being fairly firm or planning on being firm, I should say, <laughs> where either everybody's virtual, right? And then we can optimize in ways that make that a level playing field for everyone. And actually virtual mm-hmm. has been awesome for introverts who can still, you know, participate through chat and have these other avenues to be able to do things, uh, which has been interesting to be able to see and make use of. And if we're per- in person, we're fully in yeah. person. Got it. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing like, I remember two major things that shaped my career there related to this were seeing Tufty in person with his yeah. book Dwight from Glow. Galileo <laughs> with the Sparkline <laughs> thing. And uh, another person um, who, who you kind of remind me of in terms of your business and what you're doing is Nancy Duarte. Mm, and she yeah. does all the presentation stuff. And yeah. it's I remember I took her class in person and it was like life changing. I was just yeah. blown away. So, yeah, there's there's a, there's a lot of value there being in person, a lot of things that get communicated um, that you don't get in any other medium. Right. Well, it, because there's so many little cues that you can pick up on when you're in the same space with someone that you just, when people are flattened to two dimensions, mm-hmm. you don't see in the same way, right? Where someone's eyes crinkle or they get a look of confusion, where if you're in a room with someone, you can actually use that and pause and go into something in greater detail or ask a question. And that yeah. becomes harder. The foot tapping or the pencil, moments. Yeah, little exactly. fidgety things going, hmm, this guy's having a hard mm-hmm. time with what we're saying or confusion or whatever. Yeah. So when just so the way you can use the physical space is fun too, right? So you walk over towards that person and yeah, yeah that changes their behavior. Absolutely. So, so let's get into some of the stuff about data visualizations. I mean, I, I, you know, I I would love just to catch up about life and, you know, moving and tech and all that. But I think what people are interested in specifically with you is how, like, like, let's try to get some of that storytelling with data magic on the, on the, on the screen here. So the first thing I wanted to ask you about, and we talked about styles of communication. I mean, what would you do? Like, is there a way that like guiding principles for somebody that is an engineer r- pulling reports from some system that they have? I don't know, some log stashing. Here's the number of events that occurred, blah, blah, blah. Sure. What Are there some kind of guiding principles that a person like that could take and say, oh, let me just take that and apply this. And I am I'm at least better off than I was. Yeah, I mean, I think the basic thing that you want to do, almost irrespective of the scenario, is anytime you want to show somebody data, know for yourself why you're showing them, what you want them to see, where you want them to look. Uh, And actually take some time to think about that and even put it into a sentence, right? When you look at this graph, I would like you to see blah. Because once you're clear on that, then that can help guide the type of graph you choose, right? And often it's useful to iterate through different views of the data to figure out one that's going to be clear when it comes to what you're trying to get across or where you want people to look, what you want them to see. You can also do things to the visual design. Right? So if I decide I want you to look at this one number or this one data point, I can format that differently to create visual contrast. You can think about doing that by making, you know, we'll often take an approach where everything's gray and then you use color or black sparingly to draw attention. But really any sort of visual contrast that's sparing is going to work in a way that just draws your audience's eyes to where you want them to look. Then you want to think about, all right, if you've chosen a graph that's going to work well for what you want to get across, you've indicated somehow visually now where you want people to look. Bonus, by the way, if you get rid of clutter, right, <laughs> things that don't need to be there that can be distracting, right, strip out chart grid junk. lines and chart borders and anything that doesn't need to be there, right, that stuff just makes the graph feel heavier and harder than it needs to. Uh, but even if you don't do that, in any case, you know, when you've formed that sentence about what you want people to see, write that down and put that on the graph, <laughs> either in the title or in annotation, right? So you've chosen a graph that makes sense. You've indicated visually to people where to look. And now you've put words there that you can also say out loud if you're presenting the information that tell people why you want them to look there. 
And those simple things, and then these, by the way, when you're the one designing the graph, these things are all completely obvious to you as the designer, mm-hmm. because you know your stuff, you know your data, you know the project that you're putting it together for. You've got all of this context that is mostly, if not entirely absent for anybody else looking at that same graph. And so when we're designing graphs for other people, you have to be explicit in making those distinctions for them, right? Here, I've already looked at this data, I've analyzed it. So now you, audience or user, you don't have to do that work. That that was the value I added to the process. Here's where you look, here's what you see, here's what you should do next. Um, And I think that do next piece is important and often gets skipped or missed or overlooked. The action, right? The action. Yeah. yeah. What, what do I do now? Now with this piece of newfound information, and am I ready to make to do that? Whatever that could be, something I'm not ready right. for. And that's you know? okay. And I actually, I am. I'm a big advocate of being explicit and telling people what you want them to do, even if you might not be certain that's the right thing, right? You can certainly caveat that appropriately. But the challenge is when you stop by simply showing data, it's really easy for people to just say, "Okay, that's interesting," and then move on yeah. to the next thing, or ask you for more data, right? Because they're they're waiting for that next. Thing. Whereas if you take it to the next step, you say, not only here's the data, but here's here's the action that you could take, or here's actions other people who've been facing similar things have taken in the past, or here's some options to consider or a discussion to have. It gets people focused on the what now, what next, which mm-hmm. just changes the entire conversation. Because when you don't do that, often the conversation ends up being about the data or about the graph in ways that actually isn't helpful or useful for anyone versus about what does this mean for our business? What does this mean for how we could do things better going forward? So anything you can do to shift the conversation there so that the data becomes a piece of the process, but the data isn't the end all be all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. And and I think what you're, in, and this is where maybe the storytelling comes from it. So in the past few years, I've gotten really heavy into making YouTube videos and doing this whole other thing. Yeah. And as a part of that, I've really studied storytelling and storytelling is very similar to what you're saying in the sense of like, I have a message, I have all the plot points if I'm making yeah. like a narrative fiction or something. And mostly it's removing things. Yes. <laughs> mostly it's, here's all the things I could say, but here are the key ones that move the story forward. So is that, I mean, from, from a story standpoint, it kind of sounds like what you're trying to do here is marry those two things. Here's the data viz, Absolutely. which is a plot point in a story, yeah. right? And then you here's here's the, the journey you can take. Here are your different choices. So did yeah. you choose the word storytelling? I mean, is that intentional or was it just, did it sound good? Like, like storytelling in this sense, are you thinking like literal storytelling or is it more of just how you, we should look at data should be a journey similar to a story? Like, where does that come from? Really the literal piece. So when we're talking about this, when we're teaching about this, when it comes to the story piece, we'll often step back and actually get into the narrative arc, right? You start off, there's a plot. Uh, tension is introduced. That tension builds in the form of a rising action. There's a point of climax, a falling action, a resolution. Mm-hmm. Because when you can take your audience on a journey that follows that path, roughly, you can just, and I've seen it so many times, right? You just, you can get attention and interest and understanding in ways that the typical business report does not do. Uh, or right, the, the typical business report, you're relying on someone to have natural interest for it to hold their attention. But there are actually strategic things we can do that bring story into the mix that will make that happen almost irrespective of whether they came in caring or not. Right. And when you can tap into that, it's this like crazy powerful thing. So I think too many people, in a, especially highly technical folks, it's easy to shake off and say, oh, communication, right? That's, that's like the soft skill or storytelling has become this right. crazy buzzword. But you can be very strategic in the way that you apply these things. And for anyone who's doing things with data, if you can't communicate that data effectively to someone else, you run the risk of all that fantastic work being completely lost or misunderstood or misused or ignored. And that's what we're trying to keep <laughs> from happening. Right. Um, through so is there, this. is there sort of a template that we could lay out for people? I mean, if I were, if I'd never heard of this, never thought of this, but I am great at making charts 
Yes. But wh- wh- where do I, you know, so I can do the data viz part, but how do I do the storytelling part? Like what are, yeah. what are the steps or what's the template I should follow? So first I would say, look for scenarios where it's going to make sense, right? Don't force story everywhere um, because sometimes it doesn't make sense. And for me, where story makes the most sense as a communication tool with data is where you know something and you want someone else to know that thing. And especially if you now want them to do something based on that new understanding. So when you've got a scenario that roughly looks like that, then you want to start by being very clear on what is it that you want people to do. And we'll often have people do an exercise called the big idea, where it's thinking about you know, their point of view, the audience's point of view, what's at stake and what they need to have happen and bringing all of those things together into a single sentence. And actually, uh, we have the worksheet that's available to download. Uh, if people go to our website and just search the big idea, that'll come up and that's at storytellingwithdata.com. Uh, and so you know, be very clear, first and foremost, on what it is you need your audience to know and do. And then you can think about what is the journey you want to take them along in order to make that thing happen. And if someone's going from never communicating in this way at all to suddenly, now I want to try telling a story, start simple, right? Because if you get too fancy, too fast, and particularly if that's countercultural, let's say, to how things are typically done in your team Mm -hmm. or at your organization, you will be met with resistance and you will fail, likely. So that's not the way to be successful. So look for places where this will work and start simple. And so for me, the simplest story structure is plot, twist, ending. And the cool thing about this is you can apply it to an overall communication or presentation. You can also apply it to a specific graph, right? What's the plot going on in this graph? What's the twist? What's interesting that now my audience needs to know? And now what's the ending? What's the action I take them towards? Then you can think about moving beyond the graph to now if that graph is a point in my story, where does it fit in? How might I plot that? My favorite tool for doing that sort of planning is the low tech post it note, yeah. the mini ones, right? Where you can just, you can write out your ideas or the components of the story or the different data points or graphs that may fit in. Then you can start playing with how you organize them and the structure. So when you're ready to move past that simple plot twists ending, uh, I like to use the narrative arc that I mentioned before. And I'll often, when I'm plotting out stories, and I do that sort of low-tech planning anytime I'm going through something new, I do it for writing, right? When I'm working on books, uh, for presentations, it's just a useful way to get thinking without being locked into things you've created in your tools in ways that can be helpful. But I'll often just lay out the pieces of that arc on their own post-it notes, right? Mm -hmm. Plot, rising action, climax, falling action, resolution. And then I'll do some brainstorming and then start organizing my post-it notes along this. And then I'll think about, well, do I want to go through that in sort of linear fashion or chronological fashion? Or do I want to actually lead with the ending and bring that up mm-hmm. front? So I'll play around with the order, right? Always thinking about my audience, what I want them to do, and what is going to work best to help make that happen. And that's easiest when you can try to imagine things through their eyes and through their motivation motivations and their drivers so that you at the end of it are communicating not for yourself, but for them. And when you do that effectively, better conversations happen, right? Decisions are made faster or better in different ways. And it's really phenomenal to see. And You don't have to do that all every time, right? But as you can start sprinkling in some of these things, that builds confidence in yourself. It builds credibility with the people with whom you are speaking and communicating to. And then you can get more nuanced over time. And this, I think, is one of the reasons this space is so fun is that there's no such thing as an expert, right? Everyone can Mm -hmm. always be getting increasingly nuanced in how they communicate to others. And so it's this like never-ending journey process, which I think makes some people frustrated. But for me, that's one of the reasons it's as much fun. That's, I mean, life is like that. You're always learning, always doing new things. I mean, otherwise it seems boring, at least to me. So I think I'm with you. I love this. Now, do you have to be a, you know, uh, a Steve Jobs type or a Nancy Duarte to get up and do this? I mean, if I'm an engineer running, you know, DevOps, 
queries sure. off of a log stash database or something. And my team, we just throw up some numbers. Am I going to be able to do that? I mean, I, you you alluded to like, yeah, you know, don't, you know, be, be someone you're not or something like that. But like, right. What, in, especially in all the, the companies and all the lectures you've given, I mean, have you found a big diversity of the people that are able to accomplish this? Or does it always tend to be the uh, extroverts that just love attention, you know? No, I think it's a great question. And I, so authenticity is certainly important, right? You don't want to do something that's going to not feel like you. Uh, but I also would really push anyone from falling into the trap of, oh, I'm just not a good speaker or I get mm -hmm. nervous in front of others. Therefore, I just, you know, I'm not a natural storyteller. I'm not a natural presenter. Right? I, me, I am not a natural presenter. I was lucky to find something I'm passionate about and got enough energy to get out from behind my computer and speak to other people. <laughs> and it is through years of practice and concentrated effort of honing the ability to then communicate effectively to others that that happens. And so I think that's for anyone who's thinking, and even for the people who are thinking, oh yeah, I'm great, right? I love talking to others. You too. It takes practice to be good at this. It takes practice to learn how to read people in ways that allow you to respond in the moment, maybe differently from how you had planned. Uh, and really taking time and taking more time, the higher the stakes are, to practice on how you communicate. And I'm a big proponent of literally doing that. Practice yeah. out loud, saying the words you're going to say. Not to memorize them, right? But if you, one thing I'll do often if I'm, if I'm going to be going through new content for a virtual event or something that we're doing, I'll have you know, my main points. I'll know what they are. I'll know what order I'm going to hit them in. And then I'll often take walks around my neighborhood. And I think my neighbors must, must think I'm crazy or that I'm on the <laughs> phone, right? Because I'm talking to myself the entire right. time. And what I'm doing when I do that is... I'm talking to get from one point to the next so that I've created multiple different pathways in my brain of knowing how I can get there in different ways, right? So that if there's one word that I'm really interested in using and I can't remember it in the moment, that's not going to throw me off because now I have different ways to get there. I know the rough structure, but it's not until you say words out loud a number of times that it's going to sound natural saying words out loud a number of times <laughs> when you're in this sort of strange artificial scenario where you've got lots of people paying attention to you, right? And, and mm -hmm. expecting you to perform in that way. And so I think just having people recognize that it does take practice. It is a learned skill like many others. And you know, you think for you know for the engineer that you talk about, I think how long they learned to code, right? How long and how many, how much beating your head against the wall that takes to get as good presenting as you are coding takes a similar amount of effort and time. Right. And you can do it in small ways, right? Some big advocate of look for small places that you can test things out and that you can try things that fit into your day to day. And, and over time, those things build, um, you know, people will go, they'll go to Toastmasters or do these different programs to get some concentrated, uh, practice, which I think can also be good. I've had the benefit of, I talk to so many people now that for me, the practice is built in, right. and it becomes easier over time, right. For those who encounter nerves, the nerves, calm over time they're still there they're always they always are but uh you find ways to make that still work for you rather than against you yeah and it, it's an interesting i mean i'm i'm very fortunate that the majority of my work i have the benefit of editing in post so uh, i don't have as much of that, that can be a double-edged sword though because that can for me that can make it harder to do things right because you know you know it could be perfect <laughs> after the yeah. editing process <laughs> It is funny. Uh, there, there's uh, some public speakers out there that, that I follow and I, I actually see them say that they include mess ups, mistakes, because they've gotten so good at being rehearsed that it looks fake. And so oh, they dear. include oh my goodness. <laughs> flubbing their words. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. this is all they do. They've got so good at it that they have to yeah. Kind of actually tone it down. Otherwise, you're like, uh, you know, I don't know, P.T. Barnum or somebody. You're like a showman up there just doing a dance. It's yeah. like not believable, right. you know. So being yourself, huh. I think, is the key. 
And yeah, in practice, I mean, because you can see it with people, you know, the, the big famous folks out there like Steve Jobs, it, it, obviously practiced insane amounts for his presentations. That's why they yes. were so beautiful and so clean. And then yeah. you go see, you know, a Steve Ballmer or somebody else. And you're like, did you did you uh, just come in here and just read off of his slide? Like what's happening? You can tell yeah. a big difference between between the two there. So I love that. And it's good to hear. Now, if I do this, um, with the folks that you've coached and have went through your program, how, what is the benefit that they see? Do they get promoted? Do they just get their project approved? I mean, what kind of transformation? Is it more than just, oh, uh, I wanted this budget for this new server I wanted to build? Or is it more like, I'm a different person now? Like, how, how big is that transformation once someone has got, done the practice and is good at this? Yeah, it. I mean, it. It's like many things. It's one of those where you you get more out of it the more you put into it. So we certainly, when we hear from people after having gone through a workshop or read the books or you know follow different aspects of uh, what we put out there, it ranges, right? And it ranges from exactly the sorts of scenarios you describe. From you know, I'd been trying to get this thing done for a long time, and now finally, you know, they've agreed to for the budget, and we can do it. To I redesigned my reports. My manager was super impressed. I'm getting promoted. I'm you know, doing the next thing or just really, I think for me, the ones that are the most um, reinforcing are where you help someone in a way that allows them to see how to how to make things work at their organization and in the scenario in which they're working. And that, that looks different for different people, but where, where people weren't paying attention before, now they are. Or where things were just getting lost before, uh, now that work is getting recognized. That it's, it doesn't, it's not always massive, meaningful change. Mm -hmm. um, that the the small everyday changes, I think, can go a long way as well, particularly in just reinforcing and helping people feel like they have the power to be able to, to make their work good and, and to apply some of these things and to help others as a result of that. Yeah, it's making a bigger impact, right? It's more meaningful work. It's yep. uh, And that can manifest itself, as you mentioned, in different ways, promotions or just being happier and being yeah. you know, less frustrated because people say yes to you more uh, because you're able to communicate more effectively. Now, w when, I'm, w when we're designing these data visualizations, you know, there are the folks like like you and me and other folks that are data people, like our job title included the word data in some form or another, which yeah. meant that at some point we knew how to use a tool like a Tableau or a Power BI or whatever and make these things. If I don't have that skill, if I'm not a Tableau person and, you know, as easy or, or Power BI or whatever, as easy as those tools are, if I'm not that, if I'm if I'm someone else, let's say, you know, data scientists are actually kind of an interesting, like an actual data scientist that produces things like confidence intervals and all those kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Uh, you know, if if I'm one of we these used folks, to call I, them statisticians. Right. Yeah, statisticians <laughs> I can code. Right. That was the big yeah. thing. And now everyone's a data scientist. I guess yeah. it's it's an evolving uh, marketing term that gets thrown around. But let's say I'm yeah. somebody that works with data, but or you know, has some kind of role like that, but I don't have the skill set to actually use a tool like Tableau. What do I do? Is there a, a, a easier way? I mean, do I crack open PowerPoint or Keynote? I mean, wh what do you suggest for people in those situ scenarios? And so, do you teach these kind of things? Uh, we try not to, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. Um, well, the tools. So my general view on tools is that you can get most tools to do what you need if you spend enough time and, and learn the ins and outs to do that. So when someone is trying to figure out where to start when it comes to tools, the first thing I'd recommend is what are people around you using, right? Look at that, take inventory of that, because then you have built in people who can help when you run into roadblocks. Mm -hmm. And there's also benefit, right? When people are doing things in, in the same uh, program or software. Uh, Google, one of the interesting things was we could use whatever tool we wanted, which sounds fantastic, but actually meant everybody was using very different things. <laughs> also had some uh, problems yeah. as a result of that or some challenges. Uh, it may surprise you to learn that I'm going to say, I'll put a number on it, like 95 plus percent of what we do when we're teaching and the examples in the book and on the blog and in all of our videos and on the community are done in Excel. 
and PowerPoint. Oh. Um, oh. And that's because those tools are so pervasive, right? I love the fact that anyone can pick up Excel and make a graph. Right? Yep. You're not going to make a beautiful graph the first time you do it, but you can get it there and then you can start playing with things and smart Google searches and really just using the tool, right? Any tool, just making yourself use it is going to be the best way to learn it. Um, and I think we we're so used to instant gratification on so many things these days that mm -hmm. but there's no way to fast forward that process. If you're going to learn a new tool, any tool, there's going to be a learning curve associated with that. Um, but you don't need fancy tools in order to be able to visualize data well. Right. Uh, and so I'll often say, you know, the, the best tool or the first tool to start with is pen and paper. If you can get it to look like you want it to look on pen and paper without the constraints of a tool, then you can look at, you know, what tools do I have access to or can I learn? What experts do I have at my disposal who might be able to help me? And, and how do I go from there? Um, but yeah, yeah, pick a tool, get to know it well so that it doesn't become a constraining factor for being able to do things. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think that there's an obsession, or at least that I've seen a lot in the data world of this tool versus that tool, or, um, you know, I can do this and this one, or I can do this and that one. But really what you're talking about is, is agnostic of any tool. And yes. at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, I could, I could copy, I could screenshot a report out of a system I use, take it into PowerPoint and, you know, throw a little mask over it and copy and cover up yeah, this piece. Yeah, you can do some just, brute force things. And <laughs> you like, it works, yep. right? Because the idea is to communicate visually, not to uh, be good at a tool, you know? Right. And you see the other thing where people get obsessed with tools and it's like, oh, I can do this in there. It's like, but that's just two clicks in this in Excel, why would I spend 50 clicks over here or whatever? Well, and I think that's the benefit of when you get into the realm where you are using multiple different tools is just being able to be really efficient at what you do where. Um, but you don't need to have that in order to be able to do good work. Yeah. So if I am looking for a do's and don'ts, I mean, like, like let's just talk, let's just talk about pie charts for a second. Um, and I don't mean to rile you up. Uh, cause I get, no, I've too. actually, I've softened my view over okay. the years. Cause oh. I, well, I Breaking got news. flack at one point <laughs> for, I think I did a talk one time and probably had a blog post that went along with it. That was called death to pie charts, yeah. which was, I like to be a little provocative sometimes. Yeah. Like we shouldn't actually kill pie charts. They have like almost every <laughs> graph out there, the perfect use case. Problem yeah. is just, they're so often misused. Yep. All right, so 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 hit me with it because I'm with you. I actually had a website called War on Pie Charts, War on pie and charts. yeah, people would submit them, and I would send them an actual pie to whoever found the worst pie chart every year. Mm -hmm. um, do you know Ryan yeah. Robotai? He was a Facebooker, Names and uh, okay. he did a bunch of Bigfoot Tableau did data viz. He was real popular. Anyways, okay. I actually like sent him a pie one year. I think I sent yeah. Andy Kreeble a pie one year. Awesome. Anyways, um, good way to build so your network, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, we all hate pie charts. Let's just eat pie over it. Um, so, so, so for those that, that maybe like, just give me your thoughts on that type of chart. And then yeah. I would like to just ask about maybe if there's some rules of the road for like, Hey, when should I use this type of chart? When should I use this type of chart? If those even exist? Yeah, absolutely. So a pie chart you want to use or a good use case for a pie chart is when you have a whole and pieces of a whole and they can work well when you want to show when you don't have very many pieces and you want to show that one is much smaller than the rest or one is much larger than the rest. I think the biggest pit hole that people fall into when it comes to pie charts is that they use them in cases where they actually want people to be able to compare the slices, which mm -hmm. is super hard to do because we haven't aligned anything to a common baseline. Right? You're trying to compare things that aren't lined up. Just the yeah, It becomes hard. Often there's a lot of color thrown on that makes that more difficult. And actually, the biggest reason that my view on pie charts softened over time was Oh, it was probably like five or seven years ago now, there was a series of papers um, describing research that Robert Kosara at Tableau and Drew Scow had done, uh, really understanding how people use and read pie charts. And they actually, they debunked some things that had been held to be truth. Uh, for example, that you read pie chart by 
angle or by arc length. Um, it turns out it's actually the area um, mm. because they can do things with, you know, what they did things with covering up the center. So it's more like a donut chart. Donut, yeah. It actually didn't impact negatively uh, how people do things. They did all, they also showed the various ways you can skew data in pie charts, right? By making things explode or compressing or expanding them or making them 3D that all of these yeah. are bad, right? We, mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. suspected that already, <laughs> uh, but now have the data to prove it. Uh, yeah. So, and I remember Robert, I think it was in the review of my first book where I was still pretty harsh on like, don't ever use a pie basically, uh, where he said, no, don't say that. Like teach people the right way to use them versus just cut them out of the vocabulary altogether, which I think is sage advice. And so what I'll often say when I'm talking about pie charts in a teaching uh, sort of scenario now is when you find yourself reaching for one, just pause and ask Mm. yourself why. Right? If you can answer that question, you've likely put enough thought into it to make that the right choice. But that's not something we should only do with pie charts. That's something you should do anytime you make a chart. Ask yourself, why did you choose that chart? If you can't answer that question, <laughs> right. you need to rethink some things. If you can answer that question, then probably it works well enough to make things work. And actually, when you do some of the other things that we've talked about, you know, contrast to focus attention, words that tell people why you want them to look, where you want them to look, what you want them to see, when you do that sort of thing, even if it's not the perfect chart type for what you're showing, it might work well enough to be okay and still get your message across. And so there's Mm. always trade-offs when we're making these decisions. And so I think a good component of being successful is just being aware of these trade-offs and making decisions in light of them, right? There's no right, there's no wrong. I get very upset when people try to frame things that way because I find it to be very intimidating for new people coming in and just unnecessarily rigid. Um, There are different things that work and many things work roughly equally well. And so it's about figuring out a combination of things in your scenario that's going to work that time for that purpose, for that audience, for that data. You don't Mm -hmm. always have to do everything perfectly, right? It doesn't, the time to invest to do that isn't always worthwhile. So you always want to weigh, where do I, where should I spend more time? Where are the stakes high? And that's going to have an impact versus when it's not, right? And and spend attention and time and energy accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a real, I mean, it's like you said, it's a really, uh, your, your views on it now, I think are, are much more evolved and probably a better for people that are coming into it instead of, coming in going, I must do this or I must not do that. Because well, that can be it's scary. Interesting though, it because be, people, you know, people also crave that though, especially as they are learning something mm. new. It, we like to have rules. It makes things easier, right? We know what the guide rails are. And I do yeah. think that's a good way to start, right? Start by learning guidelines, but then understand also when, when do you bend them? When does that make sense? The challenge so is maybe, when we're bending things unintentionally and that's where stuff gets messy. So, so maybe, maybe when you start, just don't do pie charts if you're just starting out and later on as you get more, <laughs> you know, it's like I, I play guitar. I've been playing guitar for 20 years now. And when I started out, I mean, you know, all I learned were uh, popular songs, you know, in my, in high school, right? Nirvana, Metallica, those kind of a things. Now, now I'm, I'm really deep into like jazz and flamenco and all these other things where you do break all of the rules. I yes. would, when you first, it's exactly the same thing. Like if you want to learn music, you just learn these notes only go together in this way. That is actually not true, but right. I, but you, you haven't evolved. You, you haven't developed that skill set enough to know when to break them and why to break them, which is like jazz. Yeah. Why, if you're yep. not familiar with jazz, it may sound awful, <laughs> but if you're a jazz musician, it's, it's so much more deep than other types of music, right? Yes. It's the same concept, really. But if you're a newbie starting off playing jazz, it will sound awful, right? To yeah, everybody. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You can't just play whatever you want and call it jazz. <laughs> you know, there are yeah. reasons why you break rules in certain places versus others. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's right, that it's this, the foundational knowledge first, right? Start, start small <laughs> yeah. and learn and test and grow from that. And then you can get increasingly nuanced. So, so if I'm just starting out, would you, would you agree bar charts and line charts are, are my, my two best friends? And I, as absolutely. I get better, as I get better, I can get me, you know, I may go on Reddit and see the data is beautiful channel and see a chord diagram or all these other kind of wild things that yes. 
maybe make sense in some context. Maybe they're just art and that's all they are. But if I'm just getting started, bar charts, line charts, I'm happy. I am commu- I can do a lot with that. Would you yes, agree? I, I absolutely agree. And I'll take it a step further to say every everyone, irrespective of your skill level out there in a business setting, so I'll constrain it that way, you will be, your time will be better served perfecting how you do line graphs and bar charts than learning a vast fancy array of different chart types. Right? Mm-hmm. And to your point, once, you, once you've got those basics, then you can think about expanding your lexicon. And actually, John Schwabish's latest book, Better Data Visualizations, is a great one for that. It goes through, I don't even know how many, you know, hundreds of graphs probably, shows you what they are, how to read them, use cases that work well, why it works well. And so if you want sort of an encyclopedia of different graph types, uh, that can be a great place to look. But you don't need to start there, right? Start with the lines and the bars, get good at those, and then you can expand your your graphicacy, if you will, from there, (laughs) and then understand when you might pull in some of these other things. Uh, But for the most part, when you're communicating to an audience who is is not as technical as you are, then you're going to be still reaching for a lot of lines and bars. It's, I mean, it's funny. I don't know why I never thought of it before, but the the analogy of jazz just keeps getting better and better, right? Because if yeah. someone like you or me that's spent a lot of our career and lives now looking at charts and making charts, we can probably look at a really complicated, messy, giant, crazy chart and we can appreciate it and and pick it apart in ways that someone that was new to data visualization is just completely overwhelmed and doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know where to look and it's just a mess. Yep. Right. Well, and the, and the opposite, I think, where someone who maybe hasn't spent a lot of time thinking about looking at it may see one of those fancy things and think it's the cat's meow versus (laughs) someone who has been studying and using and applying these things uh, would look at the same thing and say, but that's a hot mess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I've, I have absolutely seen that where someone presents something and they're going, oh, gorgeous, look at this. And I'm going, what? Yeah. <laughs> what is this trying to tell me? I can't even figure out what the message is. It's a bunch of data, got it. But yeah. what is the message, right? So um, how is, is there a way for like an objective way we could actually do that? We could look at a chart and say, this is effective at communicating something. Are there like, <laughs> you know, certain attributes of a, of a chart that are, I don't know, somewhat, somewhat objective that you can say, yeah, that was done well versus that was not done well, or is it just super subjective? I think you can, if with the right constraints, right? I don't think you can say, you know, this is what makes a graph good or a data viz good because there are many different reasons that people visualize data, right? We've been talking Mm -hmm. mainly about you're communicating something in a business setting. That's one instance. There are other reasons to visualize data, right? It could be for entertainment or as a piece of art where it's actually not meant to inform, even though it really is a data visualization underneath that's driving it. So I think being clear on what the purpose is first and foremost. And then once you've got that nailed down or in one of those spaces, then yeah, there, there are some things that you could uh, probably get people to agree on when it comes to some of those things. So when I think about visualizing data for a business setting, the sort of efficacy that I'm looking for there is it doesn't take a ton of time for somebody looking at it to figure out what's going on, which typically means things are well titled, they're well labeled, right? if there are important points or obvious questions, those answers or context are annotated directly there or are explained by the person who's presenting it, um, makes it clear where to look and why to look there, right? The sort of things that we've talked about. And the, that is in the instance specifically where you have something you want to explain to someone else with your graph. Right? A right. graph that's meant to allow someone to explore the data on their own is going to have a different set of, um, you know, what good, what, what facets of what good looks like. Right. Um, so you're yeah, touching think, on exploratory versus explanatory. Exactly. Uh, which is vernacular we use in the data viz world. Um, could you just describe those for somebody that doesn't know what, what those terms mean? I mean, yeah, pretty, so pretty, ex- pretty basic for us, but others that might be totally new. 
Yeah. Exploratory data analysis is where you are exploring the data, right? You might be combining it with other data or visualizing it to learn things, aggregating it, disaggregating it in different ways to try to understand what is going on in the realm of this data that we can learn something from, right? That might be interesting or noteworthy in some way. The explanatory part of the process typically happens after that, Mm -hmm. where you've explored the data and now you have something you want to say to somebody else. And I think one of the biggest reasons that graphs and presentations fail is because we use our exploratory process and we try to present that Hmm. instead of seeing these as two different phases and the graphs that we use to understand data. And as we're working through things, you know, they can be quick and dirty. They can be ugly. They can be complex. If if we, as the person who's making it, looking at it, know what we're looking at, that that process looks very different many times from then how you would subsequently communicate the interesting findings that you found through that exploration of the data now to somebody else. Because they don't need to see the ins and outs of the fancy or dirty things that you looked at to get to your findings. They just need the findings usually. And so that's where we can simplify, show things in bars and lines most of the time probably, and (laughs) make where you want people to look and what you want them to see really clear. Yeah. And and I know we use the probably way too much the restaurant analogy, but it kind of sounds like what we're talking about is like Mm. uh, the back of the house and the front of the house. That's funny. I actually haven't heard that one before for it, but yeah, that makes sense. I I mean, and and, you know, I I think a lot about, um, you know, Ralph Kimball and the data warehouse stuff that he didn't, or the data marts and all that for years. It's kind of, that was the big thing. It was like, okay, you have the, the, the back office or the kitchen where we're exploring the data, looking for the things, or we're prepping our ingredients and cooking our meal and then we have the presentation of that, right? The, the yeah. front front of the house. I mean, would you think that's a fair way to think of it? Like exploratory is when you're just, when you're churning through it, you don't know what you're going to find yet or you don't know where those answers are. And the front of the house is like, I've got them. Here you go. Here's your meal. Yeah. Enjoy. Actually, Leave the, me a tip. So then you know? <laughs> the chef's table, right? Where you are actually like back in the kitchen, you can see what's going on. Yeah. That is the brave analyst who has brought some sort of interactive uh, component to the meeting and is trying to do things on the fly. <laughs> and like can happen in the kitchen sometimes Sometimes things catch on fire, right? Yeah. Sometimes that goes horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this yeah. is too good. See, I knew there would be a there would be a good uh, <laughs> uh, stuff coming out of our conversation today. That's yeah. fantastic. I love that. Yeah. So, so it's only you know, not everyone's cut out to be emerald, right? Not everyone can do the right. both presentation and the cooking at the same time. Most of us can just do one thing at a time. Oh, I love that. I think there's there's a lot a lot of good lessons here. I've got a couple more questions for you here. Um, sure. This is from your Twitter, so. Uh-huh. <laughs> when visualizing data to explain or inform a good graph blank. Oh, that's from this morning. Yeah. yeah. See, I'm doing research. I'm doing the thing. So what's uh complete this complete that sentence for me. Well, it's a long sentence. See, I put it out there because I was curious how other people would answer it. And I was actually, it was interesting to me how many people went in the direction of, well, I mean, I guess not curious, but there were a number of responses that were around truth and accuracy, uh, a number that were around uh, that it be quickly uh, understandable, right? Um coming back to some of these things that we've talked about, right? You know where to look and what to see. I think I think that's probably today, that's how I would answer it. If you're trying to inform mm-hmm. or explain, a good graph shows you where to look and tells you what to see. Oh, great. I love that. And and I think that the other thing that that I wonder about um, for what you do is, is like, where, where does the, I mean, this is like a deep passion for you. Like, like do you see yourself doing this forever? I mean, being an entrepreneur 10 years now, I mean, it's a great thing. But I I often ask myself this question. So this is a selfish question from me, uh, a younger entrepreneur or, you know, a few years back in my entrepreneurial journey. I don't mean to say younger, but you you know what I mean. Um, A few years behind you in this journey, like, where does it go? Where where does storytelling with data go? Is it, uh, you know, I mean, Ralph Kimball, I think of his group a lot, right? He Mm -hmm. had his thing and he had a small team of experts and they did their thing for like 30 years. And then one day they just said, we're packing up shop. I mean, what's next? Where does it go? I don't know. I I have I have a harder time with the the way out there, right? Yeah. And for me, ten years feels way out there. Um, maybe because I never 
I never planned that far out to get to this point. And I think had yeah. I tried to plan that far out to get to this point, this point wouldn't have looked how it looks today. And I'm very happy with how things look today. So, and that's not to say that I don't plan. We do very aggressive quarterly and annual planning process to make sure that we're moving the needle in ways that are important. Um, but right now, I, I think for me, it's, it's more of the same, right? And it's trying to reach more people and bring more people into our world and be able to help them. And so that means continue to put out great content that everyone has access to through our blog posts, and our podcasts. And we recently resurrected our YouTube channel, the Storytelling Within mm-hmm. YouTube channel, which has a ton of good stuff on there. And we have big plans there this year. We have our online community where people can go to practice and do exercise and get feedback and our monthly challenge is there. And so just we want to we want to take what we've learned and what we're learning and just make that widely accessible to everybody who's touching data and wants to be able to do more with the data that they touch and mm-hmm. be able to uh, have impact through that. And so I think it's a long-winded way of me saying for now we're just going to continue on this path and keep we'll on swimming yep. and uh, do you do you get frustrated like i do when you see stuff in the media that they use data visualization in all the wrong ways it seems like an extra time like like one of the things i think about what you do and why it's so important is how 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 uh, bad, I guess, people are at using data and data visualization effectively. And some of these people are making really important decisions for our lives. Yes. And, like, and do you, do you part, have the same thing I have? That part is hard. I think I, I don't necessarily have the same reaction at bad data visualization because I, th- I think about it maybe more, I don't know how to frame it, maybe from the academic standpoint, right? If, if there were no mm. bad, we would have nothing to learn from. Mm. Um, because there is bad, now we can figure out ways to do better. And part of that yeah. figuring out ways to do better, because I, I honestly think, or maybe I like to believe <laughs> that <laughs> the majority of the crud that we see out there of people just doing bad with data is not malicious. The majority again, I like to believe the majority is just someone didn't know better or didn't catch it or, and it was not an intentional sort of thing. And that for me is just opportunity, right? Opportunity to inform both people creating graphs, but also consumers of graphs, right? So that mm-hmm. we're not getting bamboozled by things that are not um, portraying uh, things in the way that they should. Um, and then, yeah, maybe I'll just stop. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay, so is there a way that a person that is not creating a data viz maybe, but somebody that's just consuming one, whether that's in your company or wherever you are watching the news or social media or wherever you get, you know, information from, um, is there something that, that us as data viz consumers can do when Absolutely. we look at this and go, hmm, Ask questions. And I think when, I think oftentimes when people are looking at data and particularly if they don't consider themselves data people, they have questions, but they don't ask them for the fear of maybe sounding stupid or, right, I should know the answer to that. But no, if you've got that question, it means other people have that question as well. And it might actually be some fundamental flaw in what you're looking at. So don't, uh, don't shy away from asking questions. And when you are in a scenario where you can ask questions to the person who made the graph, don't shy away from that either, because you can get a lot of information just from how that person responds. Right? If you're asking a genuine question about the data and they get very aggressive, mm. there may be something else going on there that's worth digging into and, and being aware of as as you figure out whether and how to take in that data. So you can learn, learn a lot from that process too. Yeah, but asking it, good questions. It's an interesting thing too, because if you think about it, there's always incentives, right? We're always here. Somebody's presenting you data and information for a reason. Yeah. There is an agenda. They're trying to do it for a reason. Just like we talked about, know your audience, know why you're saying this and all that. Um, what is the action you want them to take? So if somebody's say trying to sell you something and they're giving you a presentation with data that doesn't make sense, yeah, let's be very critical of this, right? Yeah. Because their incentive is to sell you something. And if there's something wrong with this, then you're going to be wasting your money or you potentially could. I mean, so there, there there's stuff at stake uh, yes. here. So it's, it's, it uh, is beneficial to us all, I, I, I think, if, we, if we're critical of what we see and we ask those questions. Would you agree? Absolutely. And I think it just to build on that, data is not truth. 
And I think we like to, or we want to see it as truth mm. because numbers feel very black and white, but they never are, uh, never are, right? It, there's bias the whole time and bias isn't necessarily bad, right? It can be, but there's bias that happens when we figure out, you know, what numbers to track in the first place or collect, yeah. how we show them, how we aggregate, how we graph it, the story we put around it. So for those who are doing things with data, try to do that honestly and with good intentions and use your colleagues around you to have them try to poke holes in ways that, that are helpful, right? So you can build robust data visualizations and data stories that are going to portray things in a way that is helpful, not hurtful. Uh, and as consumers, just be aware, right? That just because it's a number or because it's a data or because it's in a graph does not make it fact or truth and ask questions and be discerning check data sources, uh, yeah. do some of those things, take steps, and certainly don't forward anything on. Um, and actually, Alberto Cairo, um, his latest book, How Charts Lie, uh, he talks about this uh, and has talked about it in other forums as well. But just before you forward anything, and especially if it confirms something you already think to be true, mm -hmm. and I think he's specifically thinking about social media here, right, which makes sense, take a moment and gut check it, fact check it, like take a look at the source because so many things fall apart so quickly. And, you know, that contributes to the divide that we see between people in all sorts of different ways um, today. So don't, yeah. don't, don't, um, don't make that worse. <laughs> it's, you know, I, and, and I maybe being more aggressive would just say, don't be lazy. Because yes. <laughs> when you're lazy, it's easy just to go, oh, yeah, that, that checks out with my, with my barometer. It yep. must be true. Here, yep. internet, sh you know, believe what I believe. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm still, you know, I, was, I worked at Facebook and I'm still unsure that the idea about connecting the whole world in this hyper-sensitive <laughs> way is a good idea. I'm not quite sure uh, on that we've settled that debate yet. So, yeah. I don't know. The metaverse scares me, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> Well, Cole, I really appreciate your time here today. Where can people find you? Where can they learn more? Um, can we do in person? Is are there things on the books? Yeah, or are we just looking uh, online? I mean, we, what's coming so we up actually, here? Yeah, so we do we do a mix of a lot of our time is focused at workshops. We do public workshops where people join from lots of different organizations. We actually we were ambitious in getting back to in person. I think a little bit. We did one last fall here where I live in Milwaukee, uh, which was fun. Um, we in Q one this quarter they will be online. So uh, in information for that and for everything else we've talked about here, the podcast, the books, the blog, the community. You can find all of that at storytellingwithdata.com. Uh, I am at Story with Data on Twitter. Uh, check out Storytelling with Data LinkedIn. We post tips and articles daily. And as I mentioned, our YouTube channel uh, is also up and running with a ton of great content. You can find that at storytellingwithdata.com slash YouTube. And yeah. Yay. This has been I love super it. fun. Well, and congrats to you on everything here. We've learned so much. I, I know that everyone that watches and listens is going to be so thrilled. And um, I hope we can have you back on in the future. We can talk more stuff. Maybe one day Fantastic. we can be in person somewhere. Who knows? Yes. Who knows what the oh, future holds for great. us? But yeah, thanks for inviting me. This has been a super fun conversation. And so I'll just close by saying for those listening to recap what I've said probably a hundred times today already. Next time you make a graph, think about who you're showing it to and how you could make it clear where they should look and what you want them to see. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cole. Thanks, Ben. I hope you enjoyed the interview there with Cole from Storytelling with Data. As you learned and hopefully you are being left inspired and energized, anyone can take these lessons and apply them to their situation. And it's something that I've seen her do throughout these years and something I've seen personally in places I've consulted at. So it, it's very real and something that can have a big impact on you, your organization and your life. So hope you guys enjoyed that video. Stay tuned for more and I'll see you back here in the next one.